most of the time we struggle in our Christian journey is to keep up our way of life according to the word of God. And in that, most of the time we learn, we tell ourselves that, you know, my ways must be coherent with what is taught in the scripture. But the tragedy I find in it is many a time we are all focused on item-based treatment, what I would say. Oh, you are a drunkard, you have a weakness towards alcoholism, control it. You have a problem being addicted to media and social media and then you need to stop it. But I want to say that it's not that easy because you are trying to chop the branches without putting some good medicines and the good fertilizer at the root. Now a tree bears good fruit when it is treated from its root, not by just pruning. Pruning is a process. Yes, pruning is needed so that the branches may bring forth new shoots and new fruits it may bear. But for the tree to be healthy, it needs treatment at the root. I learned it sometime back only uh, because I also used to think pruning is everything about gardening. One day I was walking uh, in our Sayaks uh, pathway and I saw the gardener doing something. And then I just asked, what are you doing? So I thought he's going to put some fertilizer and I was assuming that, you know, I know what you're going to do. And then he said, sir, just cleaning this soil and putting some medicines into it to make sure that it becomes healthy. Why? Because plants are kept there and the moment he puts it into the ground, insects will come and start, you know, staying around the root. It can till, kill the plant without allowing it to be healthy and strong. So he had to prepare the soil and make sure that the roots will be forming and spreading in the right soil. That's the time I understood that some sort of a treatment is needed for the plant and not just fertilizer. I understood that every time I planted a small plant in the pot, why it died out? It's because I was only worried about fertilizer. Perhaps the soil was not prepared for the plant to grow and bear good fruit. Paul in his life, coming towards the end days of his life term, perhaps the last moments, was worried about the Christians in Philippi. One of the epistles that I love so much, mostly because of the positive energy that Paul has at this moment, in the adverse moments of his life. Paul is now concerned about a group of believers whom he loved so much and so dearly and he thought about them always. Even when he is imprisoned in the Roman jail somewhere around AD 61 and 62, Paul cannot stop thinking about them and praying for them. That you can see in chapter 1 verse 3 following. Paul says that I am always thanking God whenever I think about it. And I have so many things to offer unto the Lord saying thank you for this person, for this person, for this person and for the church in Philippi. But these Philippian believers were not Jews by their origin. Perhaps 99.9% .9 of them for the Gentile background. Simple reason why I'm saying is because we do not have an archaeological evidence so far convincing which tells us that in the city of Philippi there was any synagogue. And wherever a small group of Jews, Jewish men gathered, first thing they did was to build a synagogue and to rally around in worshipping the Lord. So far we do not have, we may have tomorrow. So if that is the case, Philippi may have had one or two visitors Jewish visitors coming, doing some business and going with nobody to stay back there and form a community. So that means Paul's initial ministry as per Acts of the Apostles, Paul was ministering among the Gentiles. Perhaps that is the reason why Philippians is the only epistle where you do not find direct citation of the Old Testament. It's very unlikely of Paul. You read Romans, you read Galatians, you read any other letter, 
you will find that they all have significant amount of citations and the references to the Old Testament. Philippians doesn't have that. The reason is this. Perhaps writing to the Gentiles, he understands that they will not capture everything that he wants to say. But his language is mixed with the Old Testament ideas so much. No direct citation, but being a Jew when he writes, he has a lot to borrow from there. And now sitting in the jail, anticipating his death. Some of the scholars as they argue, if Paul was martyred the time where Acts of the Apostle ends, then somewhere around AD 62, Paul had died. And if so, this must be one of the last letters that Paul is writing. I think at this moment, if that is right, then these are some last words of advice. Last words of wishes for his beloved believers in Philippines. Paul nurtured a very beautiful, intimate relationship with them. He loved them and they loved him in return. And at this moment, Paul comes to chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. The only two verses that I want to focus this morning. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. These are the two verses where Paul is giving some final encouragement and exhortation to his friends in Philippi. He's telling them, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. And then he says in verse 9, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it in practice and the God of peace will be with you. Philippians were undergoing a difficult time. Letter to Philippians shows that there is a lot of positive energy. Paul is very happy and content with the way that these people have partnered with him in the preaching of the gospel, in the advancement of the gospel. But at the same time, the Philippian believers were undergoing a difficult time within and from outside. Within there were fractionalism, some were really upset and there was quarrel among them. Within, some had infiltrated with wrong sorts of teachings and it was spreading and Paul is worried and these are Gentile believers who may not understand the bearing upon their spiritual life of the so wrong kind or imbalanced sort of gospel that is being uh, preached among them. Paul is worried about that. Paul is worried about the tendency of the Philippian believers to imitate wrong models and not to set themselves strictly in the right path as Paul would like to see them growing. From outside, it was a time of persecution. Chapter 1, verse 27 following, you can read. Paul very clearly says that from outside there is an attack on you. So both from inside and outside they are under threat. But this community of believers perhaps like the city harvest believers have stood with the pastor very strongly in their faith and saying that we want to live but there might be a chance as this elderly apostle is imprisoned and is thinking about them. He feels that there might be a chance that unknowingly some will slip into danger and will end in a dangerous place and ruin their Christian journey. So, after saying all the things, now Paul is now coming to the last movement and telling them, hang on. You still need to take care of two things. If you want to enjoy peace in adverse times. I began by saying that many a times in our spiritual journey, we want to curtail our wrong actions by saying, stop it, stop doing. And that is not a treatment at the root. Paul in these two verses is trying to finally give them the treatment at the root of their life like tree so that their Christian life will bloom and bear fruit. Previous chapters will give you a beautiful explanation what all things you should be careful about. And these are the culminating words. Final touch of a gardener, just because before he leaves the plant to be watered, 
he is putting some nice medicines around it so that all the insects that might threaten the plant from growing will die off or at least will stay away from there. Two important things I want to point out from here. Number one, Paul is telling them that you need to guard your mind. You need to guard your mind. Mind is one of the most important concepts that Paul uses in talking about ethics. But seldom we hear preaching and teaching about the mind in Paul. Of course, there are some classical, beautiful works that are done. You can read if you want, but that might be academic for you too. But in devotional discussions, seldom we talk about the mind. We are all about action that is visibly seen. But Paul now comes to this point and then he wants to say that my beloved friends whom I love you so much, if at all you want to experience life in Christ, if you want to continue in the partnership of the advancement of the gospel daily with me or even after my demise, I want to tell you that you need to guard your mind. You know why? Because for Paul, mind is the root place from where all the actions originate. That is the root. Paul is now trying to treat them and he's trying to tell them. He uses this repeatedly, this word in different ways. Logizo, and I don't want to go into Greek and all that, but different words he's using about mind and thinking and mindset. Chapter 2, verse 5. Chapter 4, verse 7. Chapter 4, verse 8. This particular reference. All these places, he uses the word mind or think or mindset related to the mental faculty. He's talking about there. Because a transformed mind produces a radically transformed action. There cannot be good fruit if the root starts drying off or dying off. If the tree has to bear good fruit, the root needs to be treated. And instead of telling, stop alcoholism, stop watching pornography, stop watching this thing, stop doing that thing, stop saying this thing, Paul says that now what you need to do is you need to guard your mind. And how will you do that? How will you do that? In verse 8, Paul says two things. Let's go back to that verse again. Towards the end, if he says, he says, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. You need to think. You need to prepare your mind in such a way that on such things which are excellent and praiseworthy. J.B. Lightfoot, a very famous biblical scholar and the bishop of the Anglican Church, British Anglican Church. J.B. Lightfoot once said, I'm paraphrasing, he said this way, it is not enough to think about heaven, but more important is to think heavenly. It's not enough to think about heaven, but more important is to think heavenly. And that's what Paul is trying to tell them now. Teach them. Finally, finally he's trying to teach them. Summarizing of his, all of his exhortations that he's giving. You need to set your mind on things which are excellent and praiseworthy. And by adding a word if in front, he's putting it as a condition. If at all, my Philippian believers who have known Jesus through the gospel that I preached among you, if at all you think that there is anything praiseworthy and trustworthy, it is that which must capture your imagination. The word excellent, when used in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, it refers to the highest form of virtue. It refers to the highest form of Virtue and uprightness that is just opposite to the lower standards of behavior according to the world. Something that is greater than the worldly standards of behavior. Something 
which will reflect your heavenly citizenship it is that sort of thing where you must set your mind think about such things and if you learn to think about such things they are praiseworthy things whenever this word trustworthy is used along with praiseworthy like here it will mean that your behavior in the public space will be admired by others your behavior in public space will be admired by others they will look at your behavior the way you do things and then they will say wow this is great this is helpful this is for the common good this is how i want to be this is how the other person has to be but that is not going to be possible for you to become and receive admiration from others if you are not thinking about the excellent and praiseworthy our actions our behaviors will never change unless our thinking changes we can control it tie it and bind it for some days for few days like the fox that falls into the paint and comes out and walks around in the jungle scaring others like a different sort of animal has come in in the forest but soon when the water falls on him and the paint goes away he sits and shows his behavior of doing ooh he will show his behavior the right form transformation must not happen externally and impossible to sustain unless from inside your behavior will change and paul is saying that now what you need to do is that you need to think about such things which are excellent and praiseworthy which people will see and they will understand that this is what i need to have in my life philippian believers you are persecuted from outside philippian believers you are rattled by the quarrel among yourself the personality clashes that you have do you want to change it you know the problem what needs to be addressed but do you want a change to be experienced in your life come on you need to set things right at the root think about excellent things that is why what we see what we watch what we uh, meditate upon is important to nurture a holy life before the lord because what you feed through your visual or what you will hear all this attacks not your behavior it first attacks your mindset and once the mindset is colored you only bear fruit a blind eye will not allow you to see things seeing thing is actually the ability but the vision must be corrected i cannot see far simply because my vision is not right i need these specs if i have to see back i can only see some of these faces and that also will be blurred and as it goes farer it will be blurred for me i won't be able to see but what you need to do is that you need to focus on such things and now how does he explain this trustworthy and praiseworthy he says six important adjectives number 1 in verse 8 true number 1 whatever is true philippians can understand it as something opposite to the values of those preaching gospel with wrong motives in chapter 1 verse 18 Paul talks about some people who preach out of good motive and some out of bad motives and those who have bad motives in preaching doing ministry still with bad motives they are not true truth belongs to god they do not mix worldly things and they do not compromise on essentials that is so whatever is true set your mind on that let truth be the compass of your life that will give you direction number 2 the second word he uses the adjective he uses is whatever is noble the word noble means honorable worthy 
and above reproach. Above reproach. What must you, on what should you set your mind? That which is honorable and worthy, which is beyond reproach. It's not your ability to cover up reproachable things of your life. But it is your ability to live honorable and above reproach. That will make your life noble before others. Philippians, forget not. Your persecutors outside, watch your life very carefully as you live inside the church and outside the church. They have a better scanner than you can ever imagine. And they will dig out everything hidden in you. Don't think that you will survive as a godly community in Philippi unless you will focus on noble things. Many times we think our covering up is going to be the best weapon to live our life in this world. And then we are surprised on one day when everything is opened up. Everything that is shameful comes out. But what matters is, we try our best while everything is good, everything looks pleasant, everything looks honorable, we really become noble in our behavior. And nobility doesn't happen in action alone. It must begin from your mind, on what you set your mind. The third thing, right. Whatever is right, the word is, means, literally means just. That which the other person deserves, you give him. That means you do not rob the other person of what he deserves or she deserves to have. Whether the person demands or not, you give it because the other person deserves it. Our God is just and righteous. He deserves it. Even without demanding worship from us, when we offer worship to him, is the right offering that we give to him. Be just in your dealing with others, a small child to an elderly person. Whatever the person deserves from you, give it. Don't hold back. I'm not saying about just about money or something. Everything. The respect, the honor, the love, the care. Give it. That is noble. Fifth thing is pure. It is a cultic term. Cultic term means used in worship context in Jewish Old Testament system. Pure. It refers to purity. The purpose for which it is set apart both in motive and in action, there is transparency and there is holiness associated to that. And finally, he says, lovely and admirable. Lovely, this word is in Greek that is there is never used in the New Testament. So you have to go outside of the New Testament to find the meaning of the word. The word would mean something which makes others delightful and gives pleasure to them. Philippian believers, when you relate with outsiders in Philippi, a fully Romanized city known as the miniature Rome of the East in the first century, all the Roman veterans were living there. Official language was Latin, not Greek. Roman emperor's presence was felt everywhere in such a situation. If you have to be lovely, you need to bring deep pleasure in others. When they relate with you, they must feel the joy of relating with you, knowing you. And that will bring the final thing is whatever is admirable. It is a summarization of the, all the five words that he has used. In a sense, it captures everything together. Admirable. Admirable for others. How will it happen? When you understand all these things and transform your mind, your behavior will naturally reflect what you sow in your mind. 
let us not waste our time in just pruning let us also spend time to safeguard the root because the condition of the root will reflect the life that we have in ourselves and paul towards the end of his life very soon he will be martyred and paul wants to tell them don't misunderstand me your christian testimony will not grow out of just pruning that i told all in previous chapters but naturally that will happen in you if you are able to take care of your root your mind that's why in chapter 2 verse 5 paul says let us have the mindset that is the word there the mind of christ the mindset of christ that is just as christ would think about true noble admirable pure right things so also you also build it up that is excellent where these six adjectives are not found that is not praiseworthy that is not truth that is not excellent the second important thing that you need to do not only guard your mind then comes the second step is guard your action guard your action verse 9 verse 9 says whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me put it into practice and the god of peace will be with you do you want in your troubled days within the church and outside the church in your personal life in your troubled days in your adverse days to experience the peace of christ peace of god in you ha what you need to do is while you are controlling your mind guarding your mind guard your actions and when you are able to do these two things properly you will experience the peace of god in your life in the first century roman empire was announcing by every means about the pax romana the peace that rome brings into the world but how did the roman empire bring caesar bring the peace into the world it is at the knock of the sword the instilling of fear into the hearts of the people any different voice would be silenced by the caesar the terror of caesar brings peace that the local bureaucrats kings and rulers will shiver before thinking about going against the will of the caesar that was pax romana but paul is saying that as far as i understand the crucified christ who died for you and me who being in the god's image left it emptied himself and came down and died upon the cross and then the name that is above all other names is given to him his style of doing bringing peace is transforming you from your root and enabling you to bear fruit so the second thing that you need to do is to guard your actions verse 9 he says put it into practice this is the second imperative in these two verses first is the first one that i said about think about such things and the second imperative is this command is this put it into practice just setting your mind on high fi things good things beautiful things enjoying is not enough now it must get practical in your life practice these things put them into practice and that is where you will experience peace i often say but sometime i too fail is this that many a times we are in trouble with others is because we are not in peace within ourselves we are troubled within ourselves but we want to be agents of peace for others impossible impossible when we are in conflict within ourselves we cannot be in peace with our spouse when we are in trouble within ourselves 
we cannot be in peace in our office when we are in conflict with ourselves we cannot talk about peace in the world jesus brought the greatest peace into this world because he experienced the tranquility within himself in its perfect form both with god and both with the humanity and paul is saying the transformation now will happen in you you will experience the peace of god both in yourself with others and with god when you will start putting these trustworthy and noble things in your life put them in practice the language that is used there is directly an expanded form of saying imitate imitation is the central point put them into practice is imitation and imitation is there in paul's mind right from the beginning in see in verse 9 itself he says seen in me verse 9 itself just before this seen in me whatever you have seen in me put that into practice so imitate imitate me well let's go back in chapter 2 verse 6 to 11 paul presents jesus as the model to be imitated who had everything but still was concerned about others interest so came down emptied himself went to the cross and died and father glorified him then in chapter 2 verses 19 to 24 he speaks about timothy as the one who is concerned about your well being of philippians i have no one else to send like him because he is genuinely concerned about your well being timothy is to be imitated come down to that next section chapter 2 was 25 to 30 it talks about epaphroditus epaphroditus who gave away his everything was even willing to die but he still did not stop his journey until he met paul of course he failed to do as expected because of his physical illness but he did not return back from his responsibility he kept going imitate him honor him receive him gladly among you and then in chapter 3 verse 17 he says join together in following my example join together in following my our example or join together in following my example there the word is actually a unique word that paul uses summe metai that means join together it's not about my example alone but even others as i imitate christ join with me that's what is the call is as i imitate christ join with me and what will according to verse 9 what have they seen in paul they have seen in paul how he lived his life before them how he was concerned about them even living in the roman jail now last moments of his life still worried about their well being that's what you have seen in me and not only seen in me but you have also bad examples among you chapter 3 verse 18 and 19 many are there who are doing things for their stomach to fill it up for their belly belly is their god do not go after them why because their end is destruction so you have a bad model you have a good model i exhort you paul is saying imitate put in practice all that you have seen in me and in us not only that you have whatever you have received learned and heard all three together refers to the gospel that he has preached the christ that the gospel has made known to them if you have heard me preaching the gospel if you have learned about christ jesus and if you have received this lord in your life what you ought to do is now to put everything into your life in the remaining days so that you will live a life that is worthy of the gospel chapter 1 verse 27 a life that is worthy of the gospel and then you will bring glory to god's name my friends we will succeed in our christian life by the grace of god if we are able to first guard our roots our mind second 
be careful in what sort of fruit will we bear we have an example before us to imitate we have heard the gospel every time but we need to ask what have i learned what will be the takeaways i will leave four questions with you and you may answer for yourself i will give my answer four questions for takeaway how is your mind how is your mind a victorious christian life depends upon the control that you have over your mind or over your thinking young man young lady where is your mind set how is it is it healthy enough second thing on what have you set your mind what is that which has captured your imagination is that excellent and praiseworthy is that excellent and praiseworthy the standard that you have placed for yourself to set your mind will determine your future course of action about what do you dream all the time third thing whom do you want to emulate in your life paul is saying you have seen in us you have heard from us and who is that about christ he is telling them but i want to ask you whom do you want to emulate in your life who is the model that you want to follow in this world who will color you and like whom will you look in this world paul knows that even if he is martyred in rome at this time if philippians are able to answer these things and able to take this into their heart his ministry is going to be fruitful last question i want to leave it does your model of imitation cause you to walk worthy of the gospel what are you trying to emulate who has captured your imaginations what do you dream about who has influenced your being do all these together help you to walk worthy according to the gospel what is the use of conquering the world and losing the self in eternity what is the use of having everything today but before death in a fraction of second when you realize that everything is going to be out of my control now and there is a tint of regret remaining in your heart had i lived my life worthy of the gospel i would secure my eternity alexander the great conquered the world but all that he had to tell his people was when i die leave my hands outside empty handed showing spread like this so that people will know alexander came empty handed and he has gone empty handed nothing we bring nothing we take what we sow here we will reap in eternity may the lord be with you all guard your mind guard your actions so that peace of god you will experience in your personal life in your family life in your church life in your social life and in your professional life god bless you all